there is a uh, yeah. fundamental uh, absence of strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. right? So they have the German government right now spends these exorbitant amount of money on the alliance on uh, multilateralism. But when you ask them, so how will this alliance actually uh, save multilateralism and multilateral institutions? Literally, they do not have an answer. Okay, so it's kind of like this thing of yeah, we have these talking shops about how to save multilateralism, but you know, there is no um, actual analysis of why multilateralism is under attack and how we can stop those attacks and these kind of questions. So they and they're so obsessed with this notion of, you know, it's it's the maybe you've heard about uh, normative power Europe. Have you ever come across that term? Yeah. Yes. So this, yes. Uh, Exactly. So it's a it's a European version of this shining city on the hill. You know, like if you just do multinational stuff, and the United States is going to get so jealous, and Russia and the Chinese are going to get so jealous, so that eventually they will join the multinational club again. And if you ask me, it's just like you know, I mean, it's it's maybe a part of a potential causal uh, process, mm -hmm. but certainly not the only one. Uh, but they can't even think beyond that. Germany has enormously benefited from the American security umbrella, right, since uh, 1945. And, but it has, to a certain degree, um, taken the security umbrella for granted. So it was, uh, I mean, you know, it had to pay every once in a while a uh, price. Uh, and so in, most recently, this was as well, uh, Germany's participation in Afghanistan and, you know, like in the Balkans. So there was like a certain uh, cost to uh, uh, you know contributing to this um, to the uh, to gaining this umbrella, but now Germany believes that um, it can no longer, or like certain quarters of Germany believe that they can no longer trust the United States. And but at the same time, they're not convinced. And here's the thing: that this the EU is actually capable of providing security. So this is maybe, a, so some folks are, they think with France, they can set up a similar kind of system and autonomous sovereign Europe, but others are very skeptical. And this is, I think, what you really like behind the scenes, you need to realize that a lot of Germans are very skeptical of French, right? So like this, this image that very often is portrayed as like this very strong Franco-German tandem that is fully convinced of its power and influence is actually um, and a lot of uh, Germans and French as well, you know, I'm not saying that the French are different, they have a uh, huge difficulty relating to one another, right? So like French is a language is fairly foreign, uh, so English is you know, much more widely spoken in, in, in Germany than in French. And then just in general, you know, there's this like understanding of can we actually trust the French? Um, and this of course goes back um, centuries, decades. Yeah? So the French will always you know, like they're trying to get their own way. Uh, and so then the, the Germans think, if you can no longer trust the Americans, if this entire EU project is actually not really going to work out. So what's the alternative? And the alternative is um, a uh, Switzerland type scenario. And uh, so you basically, you know, like you keep your defenses really low. Uh, maybe you have an extremely defensive posture, what the, what the Swiss have as well. So very good, for, you know, like, at least like some kind of and so the Swiss have a lot of uh, um, bunkers and, you know, uh, set up like a National Guard type of force, but it interests so nothing about power projection. Uh, so just focused on maybe um, uh, defending German territory and then kind of, you know, having a good relationship, like commercial relationship with um, everyone out there. Uh, and so this is like a lot of German industries would love to have such a scenario that they can have trade with Russia and we really do not need to care about you know, like what they do human rights uh, wise they can have so all the economic benefits from China and you know maybe as well from the United States at least you know like they believe that even if they don't support the United States uh, in, in you know, like uh, the security sphere they can still do trade because in the end you know like there's still economic interests over there that, that will be uh, interested in, in, in German trade and so there is this uh, illusion maybe or maybe it's true that you know like although it's 80 million and it's you know smack in the middle of Europe but they can basically create a certain neutrality uh, and uh, 
and there's no real this is the actually i would say this is that uh, there's still a certain um you know uh, maybe it's still the majority that they believe at least elite wise and uh, that yes uh nato needs to be saved but this alternative of you know creating a, a neutral germany is gaining ground and that's what i see but i think you know like that they really haven't got this you know, and that to a certain degree if you really want to be uh, you know, I mean, at least it's, it's, uh, it's not, I mean, you know, we need to, uh, it, it will be in a massive contradiction with the Germany that, you know, that, that is uh, how it auto identifies right now, which is this, uh, you know, um, entity that is interested in democracy, that is interested in, in multinationalism, that is interested in human rights, um, that wants to do good, um, and so So Trump has certainly accelerated this, right? And it has made it crystal clear that something is off from the Trump Atlantic relationship. But Germans are very much aware as well that, that the Trump phenomenon and this the questioning of NATO and the Trump Atlantic alliance goes much deeper than Trump per se. So they are aware of, you know, like this ideology of restraint and that, you know, even um, Gates and, and you know Obama, um, they were already uh, quite critical of NATO and uh, maybe not wanting to withdraw, um, but that these ideas are out there uh, was you know like very much uh, um, something that was on on uh, um, Germany's mind. And here, so I think Huawei was actually quite influential there as well. So I remember you know, at the Munich Security Conference this year in February. Um, you know, it really hit Germans hard because this was the, one of the first instances when Germans were kind of asked to take a side, like quite powerfully. So uh, Pompeo gave a speech there and basically, you know, put in, in a different form, either you're with us or you're against us. And Huawei is one of these uh, points. And, and Germany very much wants to have Huawei and build up the, the 5G infrastructure. So without U.S. pressure, there would not even be a single doubt about this topic. So Germans have, when you look at a lot of these uh, surveys, Germans have uh, very little uh, uh, discomfort when it comes to China. Now, there was a, a recent poll that came out by a big polling um, institute here in, in, in Germany, the Kerber um, Foundation, and um, it you know like it showed that the German population so 36 percent want closer relations with the, with the China and only 37 so one percent more with the United States so you know this is like what's the German balance right now and so very little distrust uh, uh, and, and a complete misunderstanding why the United States is, is so worked up uh, about China so there's a very strong pro-China community as well, you know? I mean, like the car industry and a lot of other industries make billions in China. And so there's a real kind of, you know, like, I mean, you know, like you want to, you know, why not be uh, anti-American and pro-China, right? So, and so just yesterday they negotiated this EU position on Hong Kong and the Germans were the least uh, supportive, you know? They were kind of like, we don't want to condemn Hong Kong. Yeah. So it's all these different elements here um, and no real, you know, like where do we actually want to be in 25, 30 years? How does the world order look like uh, that we want to live in as, as, as Germany and as, as uh, Europe? You know? And there's no kind of like strategic uh, vision on that. Actually, back to the end of the Cold War. So as um so there are three different theories on how the Cold War ended now, the first one which i think is probably the most uh, trusted in the united states uh says this had had a lot to do with one of reagan and the military buildup, which then forced the soviet union to reconsider because defense spending was just out of proportion they could no longer compete with the united states and then um had to give up under gorbachev they decided we can no longer compete the United States is outspending us, so we're engaging in this quid pro quo, we're opening up, um, you know, and answering to a Reagan's call, tear down that wall. We say, okay, you're tearing down that wall um, because, you know, we prefer to have 
some kind of economic relationship and get out of those arms race. So very heavy focus on uh, military spending and to sort of be military superiority in the United States. The second interpretation is that this has a lot to do with these domestic movements, so that you have Solidarność in Poland and as well here in, um, in Berlin and in Leipzig and in East Germany, a lot of folks going on the street and a grassroots movement developing, demanding change in this grassroots movement and spinning out of control. But the third um, element of this, uh, and it's kind of related to this grassroots movement, is in the end, um, it's uh, a normative argument, or, or like an ideational, constructive argument, and it says that uh, folks behind the Iron Curtain, that they saw that uh, Western Europe was so much better off, uh, not just uh, when it came to um, economics, but as well, democracy, and, um, um, and freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and so forth. And so they they were so attracted by this other model, so they actually stood up to the to the forces um, in the East. Right? And this is what motivated them to then go on the street and, and organize these demonstrations. And then these, and in, in Europe, frankly, this is the, if you ask the average informed person, this is the answer that they would give why they all came out. And so they're not really aware of uh, missile defense and so was and, and Reagan and this is not the story that they tell themselves. Uh, it's a story of that Western Europe um, was able to you know shine um, so brightly and so it attracted the folks um, from Eastern Europe and, and motivated them to go on the street and, and, and this uh, was in the end the result why um, the Iron Curtain came down. And then at the EU level, uh, they kind of transformed this and developed, you know, out of necessity and out of ideology, but necessity because there was no military and there was only a limited budget. Um, but then as well, because they had a certain degree of eagerness um, to project power, and they thought we can do the same. Right? So the story of the United States shining city on the hill that was so, um, you know, very preponderant a century ago, that this could now actually, this image could be taken up by the European Union as this new entity in world affairs, where you had you know, different cultures getting together and you had you know, like freedom of circulation and, and you know, democracy, um, very strong um, support for human rights in the world. Uh, and so um, via, uh, just by being this entity, um, other uh, states would like to want to become like the European Union and see close relations um, with the European Union because in the end they wanted to become like Europe uh, because Europe had as well like a very developed uh, welfare system this was like another component of this uh, so you know if you were then a country in Africa or a country in Latin America a country in Asia and they were seeking closer relationship um, because the population in those states said you know what Europe is so fantastic it's so great let's become an ally, not necessarily a military ally, but a foreign policy ally with Europe. And so the power of attraction. And this is basically until very recently and still, you know, like a very powerful uh, uh, you know, idea uh, at the EU level that this is the main power tool of the European Union. So the power of attraction, not the power of the military, which is coercion. Uh, or not the power of economics, which would be, you know, using economic means to uh, offering an exchange or coercing as well, uh, but the power of attraction. Countries want to fall in line with the European Union because they want to be like the European Union. The difference between soft power and normative power is that there is this normative component to it. So, you know, when, when Joel and I talked about soft power and said, Folks in you know India, they really like uh, Hollywood and Harvard and the NBA. He never said that normatively speaking, uh, Hollywood was better than you know um, other uh, movie centers, and you know the NBA was normatively better than cricket. But in the European sense, they're actually making as well a normative argument. So they're saying the European model is normatively better than other models, right? And so there is that distinction. So it's not just the power of attraction per se, 
but it is as well like this is how the entire world should be because it is normatively better right or if you want to put it there's a moral component to it you know like this is if you really want to advance humanity this is how to do it so there's a you know if you ask me it's 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 quite arrogant yeah? there's a certain arrogance to it you know? saying like this is just you know like the best uh, institutional model that exists uh, out there that's basically the the main institutional form that states use to intervene abroad and so this can be peacekeeping coalitions you see them all over the place place you see them in Africa, um, in Sudan, uh, in Libya, in the DRC, you see them in the Balkans, you see them in East Timor, uh, you know, you see them in Somalia. And it's basically, and you know, like uh, a group of country, countries that, that collaborate. And sometimes they're, they, or very often, they operate under the umbrella of an international institution. So there can be the UN, you know, it's called a UN peacekeeping operation. Sometimes the NATO coalition, this is what's going on in Afghanistan. And sometimes the African Union operation, it can be European Union operation, um, you know, ECOWAS, uh, this is an economic community of West African states. They have launched coalitions and so forth. And you're absolutely right, the conventional wisdom kind of says, well, you have these members of these institutions and they basically share a common set of interests and very often as well values and, and norms to, to promote democracy and to stop human rights violations. And then they just kind of almost automatically join this coalition and then you know, go together um, and, and fight uh, a terrorist organization, Somalia, Al-Shabaab, or the Taliban in Afghanistan. But this is actually not what's going on because this kind of analysis and um, just completely underestimates problems of collective action yeah? so it's just you know like most countries around the world actually not that concerned by al-shabaab in somalia it's just reality yeah? they have a lot of other things on their plate and somalia for a lot of countries is pretty far away so what actually happens is that somehow these collect uh, problems of collective action need to overcome be overcome and in uh, the domestic uh, context, you know, there's quite some research on this topic, you know, most famously by Michael Olson, and there's always this um, you know, principle of selective incentives. Yeah? So if you want to prevent free riding, you need to offer something extra yeah, so that they actually join. And what we see in the international realm is something very similar. Yeah? So you have um, a pivotal state or sometimes a small group of states and they really want to see action in Somalia and they have you know some kind of pretty concrete interests what can be security interests and uh, you know in Somalia a lot of countries are interested in do a lot of trade you know, so there's like a very important shipping route um, that connects uh, mostly Europe um, and uh, Asia but as well um, goes to um, India uh, and so those countries really care about fixing their country and fighting al Shabaab. Yeah. And then they need to bring other countries on board. And a lot of this um, uh, happens via bargaining. Mm -hmm. So you need to actually um, argue and, and sometimes as well, uh, bribe countries to join this uh, coalition. And so you need to offer them a selective incentive. Sometimes this is material, so this is money, yeah, so you pay for the troops, you give them um, military equipment. Sometimes it's a site uh, deal that has very little to do with the actual operation, so it's a trade agreement, or it's debt relief. Sometimes it's really quite vague. Um, I've come across cases where the foreign minister of a country wanted to uh, get his daughter to Harvard, and then you know, like the United States had to make, you know, like the security, national security advisor had to make a phone call. Um, to uh, Harvard admissions. So it's actually quite, you know, like bizarre what the extent of these kind of could propose can be. Uh, but in the end, you know, what matters is uh, a coalition in the end is collective action, right? It's a product of collective action. For this, so collective action doesn't occur um, automatically. Uh, and for it to occur, you need to incentivize states. And very often this, uh, you know, happens by these pivotal states offering some kind of um, side payment to countries so that they join the coalition.
how it works is um, so this pivotal nation, right? So or this little group of states that really wants to see intervention uh, in the Iraq War that would have been the United States. Um, in uh, you know in Mali, that is a big operation right now. It's actually in France. So we really want a big UN operation deploy there. They kind of um, you know organize the political process, and then you know like there are these calls for participation. Because these are public calls at the UN. You know like how about um, you know joining the operation? And often you actually have some volunteers, and so they wouldn't themselves have organized the operation because very often. Um, you know, too much hassle, they don't have the political clout. Organizing it, an operation is, is hard. You need to mobilize international institutions. It's quite, you know, like a certain degree. You need to, uh, you know, like, um, militarily as well, uh, have some kind of structures in place. So there's only a fairly limited amount of states that has the capacity to politically organize the launch of uh, an intervention, to count about 10, 12. But you have then a country such as, um, you know, uh, Italy, for example, that says, yeah, you know, uh, Mali is actually a good operation because we were, you know, um, having a lot of trouble with immigration and we can somehow, you know, stop the war in Mali, maybe immigration stops, so we both people join. You know? So you have often a small group of countries that joins without any sign. You know? And then you actually have as well some states that are so, uh, so called, I call them um, opportunistic states. They're, they know because it's the practice and it has been going on, I found since uh, Korea, so since 1950. Uh, and even you could even extend it uh, to, uh, before the Second World War. But my research started around then in 1950. They know exactly now the United States is actually quite vulnerable. Uh, now France is actually quite vulnerable because, um, as you know, the, the big picture of things. And the United States and other middle great powers, however you want to call them, do have a lot of cloud. And if you're a developing country in Africa, for example, or in Latin America, for the most part, most of the negotiations are quite asymmetrical. So it's uh, in trade negotiations and in debt negotiations, the United States, for the most part, can call the shots. But here, actually, it is an, oppor like an opportunity for these countries to kind of turn the tables a little bit because in these moments when the United States is constructing a coal solution, whether it's for Iraq or for Afghanistan or for um, Sudan, they are quite needy. Uh, there is quite uh, a pressure. It's not that easy. And so what you see uh, is some countries really haven't understood that game and then approaching the United States and saying, you know, I think you need some help in Afghanistan and you need some help um, in Sudan and we could deliver that help, but how about you give us that relief, or you give us those helicopters, or you help us, um, you know, getting some kind of trade deal or something else. Right? And this is another chunk of states. Uh, so they step forward. So it's actually not the United States seeking them out, but they um, uh, approach the United States or the coalition builder. And then very often there's still a remaining um, a number of slots in this coalition. Um, and uh, here the United States needs to find um, candidates to fill them. And by the way, here the military has quite something to say. Uh, so whenever you, whenever an intervention is planned, there is a heavy military technical component that says, if you, you know, want to have, you know, a fighting chance to somewhat, you know, create peace um, in XYZ country, you need to have, let's say, 100,000 troops, uh, or for peacekeeping operations, like 10,000 or 15,000 troops. And this, these are the slots that need to be built. Uh, and so and that has been, to a certain degree, this outsourcing mentality, so that the United States doesn't want to send 15,000 US troops to Darfur. And um, we can discuss why it has a lot to do with domestic public opinion, as well to a certain degree of reluctance by the US military to do peacekeeping. So the United States needs to fill these 15,000 slots. Some of them volunteers, as I mentioned. Once the US has launched this process, they say, we think an operation in Mali, in Sudan is a good thing. So they join for free. Some are then these opportunistic states. They know they can clinch a deal here with the United States. And it's kind of sometimes a rare opportunity to clinch the deal because it's, it's a moment when the United States is actually quite vulnerable. And then very often there's still 
and a remaining number of slots where the United States wants to find contributors. And here, and this is where, you know, like it, this is a major uh, area of my research because I was kind of puzzled how does then the United States could go about finding those remaining and uh, contributing countries. And um, I found out that actually it had a lot to do with um, networks, you know, with institutional, diplomatic, social networks, so that they would basically um, use uh, embassies in, in countries, uh, but then as well um, the networks at the UN, uh, at other international organizations, and you know, um, folks in very often they create a cell, like a, uh, you know, a force generation cell, like they would call, like they kind of like try to find a, like an recruitment cell for individual operations. And then they would um, get in touch with various embassies, various delegations, and, and say like, you know, can you give us some kind of information on your host country? So for example, they would in touch with embassies in Africa, you know, like, uh, write me a memo uh, and tell me how much is your host country, meaning Ghana or Benin or Togo or Nigeria, Cameroon, how much is it interested in deployment um, to Sudan? So, you know, like, is it being talked about at all in the domestic context? Is it a topic? Um, and then, you know, like, but what is as well, like, another top priority in this country in this particular moment? You know, are, do they have economic difficulties? Do they have some kind of other infrastructure projects going on? So where do you think could the United States maybe chip in? What could be really interesting? And um, so that, you know, some kind of quick before could be constructed that we help them out with what they really care about. Uh, and then they go for us. Um, to Sudan and participate in this peacekeeping operation. And sometimes, and this is when it's interesting, the, the social networks are so detailed, meaning there's so much trust uh, between these individual actors that an ambassador would then say, well, yesterday at the champagne reception, I chatted with the foreign minister and the foreign minister told me, oh, my daughter really wants to get into Harvard, but probably she won't make it, she doesn't have the grades. And then this ambassador relates that back to Washington, and then you know, like these steps are taken. So this is how these this very huge variety of, of deals um, emerges, and it depends in the end on the quality of networks, the trust in those networks, and then the flow of information. Uh, and and it is actually to a certain degree, it's um, it's a technique. You have to be good at this, picking up these preferences of of the key decision makers in those countries and then making some kind of offer uh, and in countries where you have an elite uh, or a government that is um, you know, very influential and, and this does exist in a lot of countries but there's not a lot of input from parliaments there's not a lot of input from other experts and it's basically just a small handful of, of the leaders that, that decide when the deployment happens these you know very uh, parochial uh, side deals can occur uh, as I mentioned, you know, like getting uh, uh, children into schools and, and, and you know, like other, other kind of deals. One would think that the World Trade Organization in Geneva just deals with trade, right? So it's, it's built to uh, adjudicate in these trade matters. But the truth is, um, most countries have delegations. Uh, at WHO. And then there, you know, like there are these summits. As you have people who fly in, and any kind of summit, you know, like short, sure, there's the, the official part. You know, uh, they sit around a table and discuss the, the subject matter. But as always, there's then as well the unofficial part. This is when they um, uh, drink coffee and have meals and go for a walk and sometimes do, you know, like as well other activities. They go to concerts and, and whatnot. And by the way, you know, any G7, G20 summit, the uh, UN General Assembly in New York is huge um, in that regard. There's so much uh, activity around the formal part, so to speak. And every single time these diplomats um, uh, meet, and if you're a trained diplomat and you're really good at this, you can pick up information, right? Because in these kind of events, you can find out and sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, what's really on a, your counterpart's mind, right? What they really care about, what kind of like the top preferences are, and what they do not care about, 
Uh, and then as well, you know, like where there's kind of like leeway in bargaining. Uh, and, you know, so my uh, research focuses on military coalition building, but the truth is coalition building is in every single issue area. So, you know, like whether this is about immigration, whether this is about, um, you know, financial, financial um, instruments, whether this is about, uh, of course, trade, uh, the environment, you know, like you name it, every single time you need to create a coalition. And very often these coalition building processes, they actually occur with kind of a similar principle as the one here in the military uh, coalition building process, meaning you need to bargain other countries on board of the coalition, on board of that project. And this bargaining, and this goes a little bit into bargaining theory, in general is always um, much easier if you have a lot of information available. And this information, if you're a trained diplomat, gets picked up in these um, diplomatic, um, quote unquote, encounters. And what is really important is that because we're all humans, right, when we are even in a setting of the World Trade Organization, we cannot just talk about trade. Very often in this context, two um, uh, foreign ministers or two trade ministers, they talk about all sorts of other stuff that they care about, you know, what goes on in their countries. And, uh, and so it's, it's this uh, private information um, that gets picked up very often in the sidelines of these encounters that can be then so valuable in the construction of, of coalitions. And so multilateral institutions, kind of any, uh, you know, uh, diplomatic encounters, um, very often like the value of them go way beyond just like the specific subject matter that they're supposed to handle in this particular moment. So actually, you know, in my research, I found that a lot of coalition building doesn't happen in, you know, like a typical military context, yeah? but it happens at the sidelines, even of Davos, uh, that is a World Economic Forum meeting uh, in, in, uh, in Switzerland, in, in Davos. It happens at the um, UN General Assembly. It, it happens, uh, you know, at, at other uh, meetings that have nothing to do actually with the coalition uh, per se, or the conflict per se that the coalition is, is supposed to address. Because it's one of these cases that basic information is completely declassified. And so you really get these memos where you actually see those uh, quid pro quos written down on paper. And that's of course much harder to get for more recent interventions such as Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, like for some other cases. So what happened here was that um, you know, Truman and, and Dean Acheson absolutely wanted the UN involved. Uh, it had actually got to do with legitimacy concerns. Right? They really wanted to signal to uh, the Soviet Union mostly that this was not just a US intervention against them, but this was um, you know, the world uh, united against the Soviet-inspired aggression in Korea. That's what they wanted to signal. But very quickly, they found out that even some close allies, such as Canada and the UK and even Australia, they really didn't really think that Korea was such a big deal. They thought, you know, like a lot of these uh, uh, allies, they thought that Korea was a distraction. You know, so if you get fucked down in Korea, the Soviets would use this and then intervene either in Iran or um, in Western Europe. And so they're actually telling the United States, this is not a good idea, and you're not participating. You know, you're you know, getting stuck up in a conflict here, which is not useful. But for various other reasons, which actually have lots to do with all the domestic politics with the um, NSC 68 and the Atchison very personal preferences of how the Cold War should go, they wanted that war. Mm -hmm. And so they started basically, you know, like doing a very uh, structured recruitment process to bring as many countries on board of this coalition as possible. And initially, it was um, you know, like these calls for participation, you know, who wants to go? Very few countries volunteered at the time. And then exactly what I, uh, you know, like mentioned um, earlier, it was um, very targeted uh, recruitment. So they were asking uh, embassies almost all across the world to um, write memos back. So how much is the country interested um, in Korea? What do they think about this war? Then, to a certain degree, there was as well like the question: Do they have military um, capabilities that are somewhat functional? 
and what other topic really matters um, in this particular moment to this, the leadership of this country where the United States maybe um, could offer them a quick quo call. And so all this information then came back and there was a kind of a working group established uh, in, uh, under the leadership of uh, mostly Dean Atchison who in, in the State Department. And then they really went through this entire information and created the ranking of countries where they thought it would, would be most likely that these bargains uh, succeed. So on this uh, um, list then they had the UK uh, and here, you know, like they were pinpointing on the fact that the UK was in really dire strait when it came to um, uh, economics. Uh, so they were basically thinking we can actually, you know, like um, force them to participate in Korea by uh, threatening them to uh, withhold economic assistance. And they um, had on the list very high up as well in South Africa. Uh, so this was a case where um, apartheid was just being uh, established and made an official uh, state policy. Of course, it was highly contested. Interestingly, um, the United States in the beginning was very skeptical of apartheid as well. Uh, but, um, you know, they thought it implicitly they would somewhat protect South Africa. For example, at the UN, uh, South Africa would then help out the United States and Korea. Mm -hmm. So, and this was one deal made, but there was as well more, they helped South Africa with fighter jets and even with a um, nuclear, uh, so civilian nuclear uh, agreement. And then you had um, Colombia. Uh, Colombia was uh, domestically, divided so it was you actually had a staunchly capitalist leader at the time in Colombia but it was facing uh, a, a communist revolt uh, so here an offer was made that um, you know like this the, uh, capitalist uh, leader would be shored up so um you had all these uh, you know like very systematic uh, uh, gathering of information which countries could be brought on board, what would they need to come on board um, to build up this coalition, which in the end was then a coalition and to a large degree, not necessarily of countries that fully really believed in, in fighting the communists in Korea, but which were brought on board because they got you know, various uh, kinds of, of favors of great side deals from the United States. And you asked about uh, China. Um, so you know, to a certain degree, what you can what you can see is that these um, pivotal states or these coalition builders, um, they do. So there is, to a certain degree, a, a certain um, uh, learning process. So it's really interesting. For example, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia launched this operation in um, Yemen, and it was actually the very first military intervention that Saudi Arabia had ever launched. And if you look very closely, it is a coalition. Yeah, so you have Sudan participates in it, you have the UAE participating in it, you have, um, I think, uh, um, is it Morocco uh, is, is a member, I think even Somalia is a member. And even here you can trace how in uh, Saudi Arabia bargained these countries into the coalition and what type of uh, trades were made so that they uh, would come on board. And so China slowly realizes what it was for the longest time, it was not in the business of building any coalitions in any kind of deal. Right? So China was a country that was kind of laying low. Uh, it was not um, initiating any kind of uh, political, like collective, international collective um, uh, action. Uh, but, you know, with the rise of China, of course, like you see more and more of the eagerness because in the end, you know, like this is, if you really want to show power, collective action is a key product of power. For a lot of actions, for a lot of desired outcomes, you need collective action. You cannot just like, do it on your own. And so China learns more and more that they have as well to engage in these um, kind of processes. And they, you know, like they do it in fairly smart ways and, and one way how they do it is exactly establishing these, these various uh, multilateral fora um, but as well you know like a lot of bilateral and trilateral meeting setups uh, and so forth and so you know my hunch is that the Chinese are still learning you know like they haven't fully uh, fully uh, peaked at their uh, uh, 
uh, capability, but they have certainly, you know, while the United States, in particular at this particular moment, and the UK are receding, right? So it seems that they no longer value these diplomatic networks. They kind of like think we can do without. And um, China is is uh, kind of in the opposite um, movement, right? So they are learning how valuable they are. 